The Bible was written thousands of years ago, but it is as relevant as ever today. The prophet Habakkuk's account is a prime example. He discussed three end time catastrophes followed by the greatest event in history. Discover the remarkable accuracy of the book of Habakkuk. Learn where we are in biblical prophecy. Next on The Key of David with Gerald Flurry. Greetings, everyone. Where are we in Bible prophecy? The book that, or book of Habakkuk tells us in very specific terms where we are in Bible prophecy, and this book gives us the big overview. It discusses four great events, and the, uh, in the process tells us exactly where we are in prophecy, and I mean gets very, very specific and precise in many ways. The first three events are very deadly and dangerous, and the last one is the most beautiful and a wonderful event that you can ever imagine because it's going to bring a thrill, it should bring a thrill to all of us about what is coming upon this earth, and I mean in a very few years. The first great event discussed here is a war, an actual war going on, spiritual war, between God's own people. Perhaps the greatest war in God's church ever because, well, it is, it is great because there are a lot of people involved, and that means eternal lives are won or lost. So that is extremely serious. The next great event is that a new superpower is going to explode on the world scene. And it's not Russia, it's not China, it's not Iran. It's a European power. And this European power, the next great event, is going to start a nuclear World War III. And it's all very clear right there in your Bible, written over 2,500 years ago. The Earth is going to have a major change, though. The fourth great event tells about God filling the earth with hope and joy forever. Now that's something that I want to show you how it's going to be done and why it's so critical to learn that now so that we can have hope in our lives today before it actually is a reality on this earth and for all mankind. So let's see where we are in Bible prophecy and see how specific and concrete that God does get in these prophecies. Habakkuk 2 and verse 2 from the Revised Standard Version, it reads, And the Eternal answered me, Write the vision, which is a prophecy that I'll talk to you about today and uh, throughout the program. Make it plain upon the, on tablets, so he may run who reads it. The very urgent message, extremely urgent. Make it clear so people can run or really move fast because this prophecy, and this is coming fast at all of us. Verse 3, for still the vision awaits its time, or its appointed time, according to the King James. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. It hastens to the, to the end, right here in this end time. The end of the age of man ruling over man, it hastens to, to that end. And this new earth filled with joy and hope for all men and all women on this earth. It goes on to say in verse uh, 3, if it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. It will not delay. Surely, that's one of the most urgent messages in all the Bible. Tremendously urgent. A specific time appointed, it says here. This is, this is a special time. And here's what the Anchor Bible Commentary states. These few prose particles are enough to show that the discourse is not general, but it is, is referring to specific topics, concrete objects, God is getting extremely concrete and specific. 
he discusses three individuals here I'll show you in the very uh, first chapter and, and tells you that uh, you can determine who they are. Certainly two of them have already been on the scene. And you can prove that to yourself. Now that, that shows you something in the Bible that most people don't understand, but God gets so specific that anybody ought to be moved and stirred by what they read in their own Bibles. And of course it also talks about a, uh, a great court brawl and a uh, mighty empire that is already on the scene, but just waiting for its strong man. And that is going to shock the world when that happens, and it probably will happen this year or next. This, this Bible is a now book, and what you see in these prophecies is just giving you the advance news of what you'll read later in, in the newspapers and magazines and so on. But verse 5 says, again, the Revised Standard Version, Moreover, wine is treacherous, the arrogant man shall not abide, his greed is, is as wide as Sheol, or the grave, like death, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations. This is that explosive empire that's coming on the scene, and that is on the scene, just waiting for the ruler. He gathers for Himself all nations and collects as His own all peoples. You talk about a superpower, this is going to be a dramatic and evil superpower in many ways. And now they're just waiting in Europe for the man to lead it, and he's probably getting very close to that. And uh, it's interesting to watch what happens there because it is going to be very dramatic. A specific man is going to fill a role, according to Daniel 8 and verse 23 in, in this verse here. Again, the uh, Anchor Bible Commentary reads, The imagery is quite concrete. It is death as a monster that opens its maw. The insatiable hunger of death is shown by the fact that its meal of the living never ends. It just keeps destroying people. It's just a great destructive machine. And God is warning us of what is coming upon this world. And it's going to have nuclear power, and it's going to use that nuclear power to start World War III. Now that's something we need to think about, but actually, if you just look around and see what's happening in this world and all this nuclear proliferation, that shouldn't be a shocker to us at all. This is the real world that we're living in that most people just sort of uh, hide from in a childish sort of way, by sort of putting the hand, their hands over their eyes as a child would do. But this is, this is very, uh, just depicting a, like a great monster that just keeps destroying human beings. And the hunger never stops. It just keeps on going. It's all going to be led by one man. One man. Notice what it says in uh, Habakkuk 1 and verse 3, and we'll get into this court battle, the, the first great event. Why do you show me iniquity, Habakkuk asked, and cause me to behold grievance, for spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Strife and contention, well, how is that done? In, among God's own people or between God's own people. Well, strife comes from the word, uh, the Hebrew word rib, and uh, it's a lawsuit. Contention is from uh, Maydown, the, to strive at law. It, it could and should read. Notice what it says in verse 4. Therefore the law is slack, and judgment does never go forth. For the wicked does compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceeds. Everything is all wrong, and the wicked gain power and surround the righteous, or the lawful. Now this is talking, if you look at the commentaries, it'll, they'll tell you that uh, this is talking about two individuals, that teacher of righteousness and, and the teacher of, of uh, evil. It's in the booklet that we'll send to you on Habakkuk, 
but the companion Bible talks about the lawless one, compasses about the lawful one or the just one. There, it, it's, it's God's people, but there are two individuals here that are actually, well, labeled very carefully uh, and specifically for us to understand. And the man represent, a man representing God and a man representing an evil power. Now, how are we going to, uh, to know who these individuals are? Well, we're going to send you a booklet that will explain all that to you. I'll just read a little from the booklet. Notice the legal language Habakkuk uses, judgment does never go forth. See, that's happening within God's own church. Something terrible has happened. Judgment does never go forth, which means a verdict pronounced. That judgment means a verdict pronounced judicially, uh, litigation, the sentence of a judge, and then the wrong judgment is just perverted spiritual truths. They had the truth and they lost it because the wicked got control of God's church, and a little, but a little remnant stayed loyal to God and fought a big court battle and won some books and booklets that had to be had to do God's work, to get God's message out to this world. Wrong judgment. The Anchor Bible says the uh, juridical language of verse 4 is unmistakable. Juridical relates to the administration of justice the office of a judge, a lawsuit, or a verdict. So there's all kinds of corruption in the courts. We have a huge book that we'll send you. All of our literature is free. But this book is titled Raising the Ruins, and it's all about that court battle. And it, it's a court battle that is prophesied in your Bible. And that, that ought to be of interest to all of us. And notice what God says about this. Behold you among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which you will not believe, though it be told you." Now the Hebrew just says this is a wonder, wonder. It, it's a double wonder. And God says, now I'm going to show you this double wonder. I'm going to show it in a, in a court setting, a court scene. And I'm going to work a miracle in your days, and even though somebody tells you about it, you won't believe it. Now, something is wrong with us just naturally. We have to do something so that we can believe God. That's the trouble with man. He doesn't believe God. Even when the miracles stare him right in the face, he doesn't believe God for the most part. But there is a little remnant that does. They win in this court battle, amazingly enough, not through the judges, but through God Himself working it out. And they received that reveal material that they needed to get the message out and could not have done otherwise. The work was temporarily stopped. The very work of God was stopped by these wicked people within God's own church. These are amazing prophecies. Do you believe God? Let me just turn to another verse that talks about the same subject, and then we'll get back to, those, uh, to that first chapter. But this is Habakkuk 2 and verse uh, 4 from the Revised Standard Version. It says, Behold, he whose soul is not upright in him shall fail, but the righteous shall live by his faith. The righteous is what it should read and, and does read in most of the uh, translations. But look, if, we don't, if we're not upright or if we're proud and self-willed, God won't give us faith. But if, we, if we're righteous, if we're lawful, and we obey God, and we go to Him and ask for the faith, for faith, He'll give it to us. And it's the very same faith that Christ had when He walked this earth. Galatians 2 and verse 20 tells you that. But God wants us to be upright. He wants us to build His character, and then He will give us faith as a part of that character. We must live by faith. We must, when we see God doing something and working a double miracle especially, we must believe Him, and we must act on that, that uh, 
miracle or miracles as it is sometimes. But anyhow, this first event has already been fulfilled. We don't have to wait for that one at all. But we do have to wait for a, the, a leader for the next great world event. But anyhow, I'll just read that verse again. Behold you, verse 5 of chapter 1, Behold you among the heathen in regard and wonder marvelously, wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. See, here you have uh, in those uh, few verses there, first five verses, it tells you about two individuals and, 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 and two churches, as it were, going at each other and, and even leads into a court battle and great things happen in that court battle that certainly show God's power and how He will back and support His little remnant. No, no, no matter how small they may be, God will support them as they walk by faith. Every person has to walk by his faith, it says. Each individual. And then great things happen if we do that. Two individuals are spotlighted so God can help you see where the action is, where the work is, and how you can be a part of it if you want to be. But anyhow, that number one event has already been fulfilled, but let's get into one that's not totally fulfilled yet, but it's just lacking a leader. Verse 6, now this is there's a reason why it sounds like Habakkuk switches gears here, but he doesn't at all if you follow the story flow. For lo, verse 6, For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. Chaldeans are really just that old Babylonian system, and it's going to be coming in the name of the Holy Roman Empire. If you, if you understand a little history here, the book of Habakkuk was originally delivered to the Jews just prior to the Babylonian captivity, and it was a terrible, terrible time for the Jews. But that is only a type. That, that's only a type of what is for us today. Many prophecies tell us that. So we have to understand uh, what what these, these prophecies are all about. It says, it, it discusses a bitter and hasty nation. Well, why doesn't it give you a little more information on that? Well, because the people who understand their Bible and understand history know who that nation is. It's a bitter and a hasty nation. And it believes in a very special warfare, blitzkrieg warfare. Now. No more information is given because, well, uh, God knows that His people can very easily figure that out. That's not that difficult. That's the power that started World War I and World War II. And if you go on back in their ancient history, they have been a militaristic nation throughout their history. And it's, there's plenty of evidence there to support that statement that it's a bitter and a hasty nation. That's an unusual uh, uh, description of a nation. And we need to understand why. You can also read Isaiah 10 verses 5 through 7 where it talks about uh, this, this uh, great power and they don't think they're going to do what they're going to do, but they do. These are the Chaldeans. These are the, the, the people that have that old Babylonian system that is very deadly and dangerous when they gain power. But verse 6 is, uh, again, uh, it's talking about that uh, after the, this comes immediately after that court battle. And now this little remnant has books and booklets, books like Mystery of the Ages and the United States and Britain and Prophecy, all these revealed books that were given to a man on this earth, and he's, he's labeled in other places, and we explain that as well. These are are required to warn the people of what is coming. We have to have God's revelation to do that, and it, it is there already for the most part. 
but God keeps giving more so we can understand precisely what's happening and when this nation is going to just explode on the world scene. And I, I tell you, it's getting so precise now that this year or next year is probably going to conclude this prophecy. All they lack is that leader, as I said before, and uh, that's what we really need to be concerned about. Daniel 8 verses 11 through 25 uh, talks about that destruction of the casting the truth to the ground and the work of God was temporarily stopped, but it didn't take long until it started again because God blessed a little remnant who were willing to stand up and walk by faith and fight for God, and He always blesses that in tremendous ways, always. And you can read in Daniel 8 and verse 23 where it talks about this man that's discussed in this uh, terrible uh, military machine that, that is about to come on the world scene, this great superpower. But notice what happens to the leader. Something dramatic happens to him. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, in imputing that his power unto his God. Well, he he says now there, there's, there's an added power there, and he thinks it's a creator God, but it's the God of this world. It's, it's an evil spirit and not the true God, the great God, the creator God. This is Habakkuk 3 and verse 16. When I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble, the great tribulation, when he comes up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. So here you have that vision, and, it, and, and Habakkuk said his belly just trembled by just, just the vision. And here we have this reality all around us. You can read verse 17. It's one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. Well, let me just quickly read it to you. Verse 17, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, and labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat, and the flock shall be cut off from the fold. Remember now, this is, it was written 2,500 years ago, and what is it talking about today? You won't find a better description of what nuclear warfare and nuclear winter will do to this world when it happens. Look, it, it the, there, are no, there are no grapes on the vines. There are no olives on the olive trees. There are no uh, uh, crops in the fields. There's, there's, no, there's no sheep in the pens or cattle in the stalls. What is that talking about? Well, are you familiar with a nuclear deal made with Iran? And of course, all, all kinds of nuclear proliferation on this earth. I have some material here I was going to get into, but I just don't have time to get into it. But it, the, it, it's about nuclear warfare and how it is going to destroy us all, and it was written in 1970, how it's going to destroy us all if we don't do something about it. And that was in 1970, January 1970. And today you, you won't read much about this at all. It, because, well, again, we, uh, we just are very childish in that way. But the fourth great event, I want to just quickly mention this to you, is, is uh, Habakkuk 2 and verse 14, and look at what is going to happen. We all, we all need to understand this. And, of course, there are many prophecies in Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22, and Daniel 12 and verse 1, and Jeremiah 30, verses 1 through 9, where it talks about there's not going to be any trouble, any trouble ever on this earth like what we're facing, or there's never been that kind of trouble ever before. And notice what verse 14 says, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Eternal, as the waters cover the sea. Think about that. Now this is good news. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the eternal as the waters cover the earth. See, no matter what, how evil man becomes, God is not going to let him destroy all human flesh. He's not going to allow that to happen. 
Now, what, what you have in these four great events, are they're all tied together. Then you have the first one, and then it leads right into the second one. And then the second one, is, it leads right into the third one. And then the third one leads right into the fourth one, where Jesus Christ is going to return and just fill this earth, fill it with the knowledge and the glory of God. And there will never be men killing men anymore, God says, for the, and generally speaking. And that's the best news we could possibly hear. Until next week, this is Gerald Flurry. Goodbye, friends. The Bible was written thousands of years ago, but it is as relevant as ever today. The prophet Habakkuk's account is a prime example. He discussed three end-time catastrophes followed by the greatest event in history. Discover the remarkable accuracy of the book of Habakkuk. Learn where we are in biblical prophecy. The prophet Habakkuk wrote about four crucial end-time events, a spiritual war within God's church, the rise of a European superpower, a devastating nuclear war to end all wars, and the glorious return of Jesus Christ. Request our free booklet on Habakkuk to learn more about all four. God worked a miracle for His loyal people in a six-year court battle, giving them the copyrights to 19 written books by Herbert W. Armstrong. Without these words of life, delivering God's warning message to the world would be impossible. Thousands of years ago, the prophet Habakkuk foretold this legal victory as the world hurdles toward World War III. You can gain tremendous hope from the accurate prophecies of Habakkuk. What happened to the global humanitarian empire of Herbert W. Armstrong? Why was it necessary to battle in court for his writings? Request our free book, Raising the Ruins, for an enlightening look at the spiritual destruction of the worldwide Church of God after Herbert W. Armstrong's death. The facts about what his successors did will shock you, but this book also contains the inspiring story of a faithful few who fought against all odds to resurrect Mr. Armstrong's legacy and won. You can know where God is working today. You can judge by the fruits who obeys God and who does not. All our literature is available free of charge with no cost or obligation to you. Order today.